Every house has a history. Some of these stories and secrets are darker than others. In the early 30s, this home on Columbus Avenue in South Minneapolis became a symbol of segregation and discrimination. How did Minneapolis get over this kind of overt racism? Part of the answers in this house just blocks away. Lena Smith lived here. This house on Fifth Avenue is on the National Register of Historic Places because it was the home of Minnesota's first African-American female lawyer. Despite race and gender bias, Lena Smith emerged as a surprising leader in the fight for civil rights. Lena Olive Smith was born in 1885 in Lawrence, Kansas. When her father died in 1906, Lena, then 21, led her mother and five siblings to Minneapolis. By moving to Minnesota as an educated black woman, um, she was going to stand out in some sense anyway. And all her life she made choices, I believe, that did make her stand out. Leaders aren't necessarily born, they're made, and people have to find their path. It seemed very clear to me that she was searching. She was searching for that path. In 1915, this journey led Lena to the business of the American dream. From 1910 to 1920, the black population in Minneapolis increased by over 50%. But the growing community had few neighborhoods to call home due to discrimination. Working in real estate would bring Smith face to face with Minnesota's quiet but firm housing segregation. This might have led to Lena's next career move. She enrolled in law school at what would become William Mitchell College of Law. It just so happened that the school was one floor above her realty offices in the Plymouth building on Hennepin Avenue. She and several men, members of the NAACP, several of them lawyers, went to the Pantages Theater in downtown Minneapolis. And they would not allow black people to, to, to um, be seated on the main floor. They had to be in the balcony. So Lena Smith, along with two other male lawyers, took them to court. She added a count of assault along with her count of discrimination. I figure that means that someone actually had to lay hands on her to get her out of there. The Pantages Theater changed their policy before the case came to trial. This idea that even if you lost the particular legal case, you may have helped make progress against segregation was something that we see throughout Lena Smith's work as a lawyer. In 1921, I received my degree, and in that same year was admitted to practice. During my years of practice, I have kept closely in touch with the economic, civil, and social affairs pertaining to the needs of all groups, especially the underprivileged among the Negroes of Minneapolis. Lena Smith made history as the state's first African-American female attorney. Her emerging style seems suited for the courtroom. By the time she graduates from law school, she is wearing severely tailored suits, mannish in description by some. She's wearing a tie. What the reasons were for that, it's hard to interpret over time. I went to St. Peter's AME Church, and I remember being about five or six years old, and I had only seen her hair down once, and I remember thinking to myself, oh, she has beautiful hair, because she always wore it back very tight in a bun, and she wore very severe suits, and she always wore suits. That was her, her style, that was her signature, and when you saw it, you know, you almost immediately say, oh, Lena Smith. Lena was also a leader. She had always been active in the Minneapolis NAACP, in 1930, she became president. In the summer of 1931, Smith's trademark tenacity would be needed in what would become her most visible battle with the entrenched racism in the Twin Cities. Arthur and Edith Lee bought a house in Minneapolis, a few blocks into what was a white neighborhood, with apparently 
restrictive covenants that you're not supposed to sell to non-whites. I talked with his daughter, Mary Lee Foreman, who said that many of her parents' friends, their black friends, didn't agree with what they were doing, buying a house in that white neighborhood, because they knew there'd be trouble. No one wants to live next door to a nigger. In the early 30s, a U of M grad student interviewed black and white Minnesotans about the incident. They're lower than us. Let them keep to themselves. I had sympathy for those white people. He shouldn't have gone there. That's the trouble with these northern Negroes. It's unfortunate that there's a color line, but it's nobody's fault but God's. A group from the neighborhood formed and began talks to try to get Lee to sell back his house. Arthur Lee made clear the irony of denying basic rights to a World War I veteran. Nobody asked me to move out when I was fighting for this country in France. All I want is my home, and I have a right to establish one and live in it. While the white neighbors negotiated by day, they became an ugly mob at night. Thousands of white people began demonstrating in front of their little bungalow. A thousand people? A th you think about a thousand people surrounding your home. A white witness described the dangerous scene. I had wandered about in the rear of the crowd when one of the Negroes appeared. He was jostled about for a few moments and the common cry was, lynch him. I called to the Negro to keep a stiff upper lip. The negotiators, the press, and even the Minneapolis mayor all increased the pressure on Lee to leave. Despite his principles, he seemed ready to give in. Backing down in such a high-profile case may have solidified segregation in Minneapolis for years to come. That's where we stepped in. The trouble with our people is they have always turned their face and run. It's time to change about. Smith, an acquaintance of the Lees, took over their case and declared her strong stand to the press. Mr. Lee intends to remain in his present residence. I am president of the Minneapolis branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. We feel the issue goes deeper than his individual case. Many African Americans oppose Smith's line in the sand stance. There was fear for the safety of the Lees. There was fear that this painfully public case might make open-minded whites less so. But Lena Smith wasn't afraid. Most of those people are holding jobs from white people. Some of them were raised in the South and are used to catering to white men. I'm from the West and fearless. I'm used to doing the right thing without regard for myself. She's counseling something different. They are going to stay, that the police chief was going to have the police begin enforcing public order. Of course I want peace, but I don't want it at any price. She would go to Floyd Olson, the governor, and ask him to call out the National Guard if these demonstrations continued. That turned the tide. She took on that case, and she won. From the New York headquarters, the NAACP applauded her impact on the future. From political participation to challenging police brutality, Lena Smith tirelessly continued to take on injustice in Minnesota. She even took on bigotry on the big screen. D.W. Griffith's contentious classic, The Birth of a Nation. The 1915 landmark film features ugly stereotypes of blacks and glamorizes the Ku Klux Klan. The film was a box office draw for decades, but whenever re-releases came to the Twin Cities, Lena Smith led the fight to limit the film's local run. In stark contrast to the offensive film, the home movies of Lena's extended family present what Lena and others were fighting for, finding a quality of life and home in Minnesota. By fighting in the courts and in the streets, Lena Smith foreshadowed the successful civil rights strategies of the 50s and 60s. She practiced from 1921 until 1966. The day she died, she was late to court, and people found she'd had a heart attack. She was at home. So she never stopped once she started. 
She broke barriers both because of her color and because of her gender, but also because of her uh, intrepid nature. Well, see, she's part of a group of black people that paved a way, made a way out of no way. She was somebody who was thinking ahead. I, I think she was a visionary. Like many women, Lena was lost in history. But in 2001, the Minnesota Black Women Lawyers Network created a committee in the name of Lena Smith, keeping alive her belief in community conscious leadership through law. Today, the home at the center of the storm in 1931 is now just another South Side bungalow. Challenges will remain, but a visit up the street to Park Avenue Methodist Church suggests that the neighborhood that was once weakened by hate is now strengthened by diversity. Thanks in part to the fearless Lena Smith. Thank you.